head uh, that direction to hear these testimonies of Abby and uh, Al, who are uh, going to tell us of God's grace in their life. But beforehand, uh, we want to finish up what we began last week. So if you would turn in your Bibles uh, briefly to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And essentially, in this 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is explaining to us what uh, we'll have a living illustration of in the waters of baptism. Namely, God's work of revealing Christ to a heart that otherwise is enslaved and encapsulated in darkness. It is a miracle every time that a sinner comes to faith in Christ. Uh, we had the, my old church uh, baptisms every uh, Sunday night, and so we call that our miracle service. There was a big uh, charismatic church down the way that had a different kind of miracle service, but we had a miracle service, which was the miracle of salvation, the miracle of a sinner being brought from death to life, someone being brought from darkness to light. That is a miracle every time that it happens. It is a sovereign work of God. Let me read our passage. Uh, we'll begin in 2 Corinthians 4 in verse 3 and read down to verse 6. Paul says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to, to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Now, we began last week in looking at verses uh, 3 and 4, and we divided it up very simply into the two parts of the gospel concealed and revealed that Paul is addressing. In verse 3 and 4, Paul is essentially giving an explanation, or really in this whole passage, about the accusations that were laid against him by these false teachers who said, look, your ministry has such a small effect compared to those who are following us. Clearly, you must be speaking in a way that is unclear, that is clouding the gospel rather than making it clearly known. And clearly you have some kind of sin in your life, they accused him of, some kind of evil motives to take advantage of the Corinthian church. And that is another reason that God is not blessing you, but God is blessing us. And so Paul is in part and in main really explaining the reality of the sincerity of his ministry in light of these accusations. And so he notes that the gospel is in fact veiled to some, and not only the gospel, but his gospel, the gospel that he preached, is veiled to some. They hear it and they have no response. They hear the message and it doesn't uh, eventuate, it doesn't produce any kind of fruit in their lives. And Paul said there's a reason for this. If you look back at verse 15 of chapter 2, he says, For we have this fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, it's an aroma of death to death, and to the other, aroma of life to life, and who is adequate for these things. So in other words, wherever Paul goes and wherever a Christian minister goes and wherever a Christian goes and their life is a testimony to the work of Christ and to the person of Christ, it's going to have, or it gives off an aroma, it gives, uh, something that is perceived or something that is smelled or it's a smell that's in the air, if you will. But Paul says not everybody receives this in the same way. Some will hear of Christ and to them it has the effect of working in them death even though it's a message of life. So a message of salvation, a message of forgiveness, a message of life with God actually works in them the reality of death. Why? Because of their response. To others who hear the message of Christ and who are exposed to the gospel of Christ, it produces in them life. It produces in them the very fruit of the message it proclaims, namely that there is 
forgiveness in Christ. We're familiar with the uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son, though is what? Do you remember? Yeah, he says those who have believed in the Son have life, but those who have not believed in the Son have already been judged. And so while it is a message of life, it is the message of life that needs to be connected with faith. He goes on, he did say here, this is just a brief reminder, that this glory of Christ then is veiled to those who are perishing. And so he says in verse 15, we just read it, that for some... Is this aroma of Christ is an aroma of death to death because they are perishing. He says again in chapter f- uh, 3, verse 14, he says, but their minds were hardened. He's speaking here of the Jews who read the Old Covenant. They read of the glory of God in the pages of Scripture and His work, but they miss the true glory in that it bears witness to Christ. And so he says in verse 14, their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. And so then that's what Paul is explaining here in verse 3 of chapter 4. He says, if our gospel is veiled, in other words, if the gospel that I preached about Christ crucified and the glory of God in Christ is not perceived, it's because there's a veil that lies over the eyes of some so that when they hear it, they don't perceive any glory in it. There's nothing wonderful. There's nothing worth uh, dying and giving up everything to gain. And he says it's because it's veiled and they are perishing. And he says the result or the or the, the cause of this is because not only is it the sin within the sinner, but it is the God of this world, verse 4, who has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. We noted various ways that he does that. He does that through false teaching, and he does that through appealing to the lust that is inherent in our hearts. As I've mentioned several times, Satan has an authority granted to him by God in this age. He's called the God of this world. But the ability of Satan to exercise that authority is directly connected to any remaining sin in the heart of man. He has no power over us other than the sin that remains in us. This is why Jesus said again in John 14, 31, that Satan is coming, or the ruler or the prince of this world is coming. He says, but he has nothing in me. He has no power over me. He has no control over me. He can motivate others to crucify my body and to scourge me and to mock me, but he has no power over me. Why? Because there's no sin in me. There's nothing in me. We, however, cannot say that. And if someone is in their natural state, in other words, they've not experienced any work of God to make changes inside of them, then that means that's their total experience is sin. Their total experience is darkness. Their total experience is blinded, blindness. And so in that case, he could say then that of those who are still in that state, who are blinded, Satan is in effect... Your God, the God that is exercising his will and his influence in your life. And he has blinded the eyes. And he says in other places, in 2 Timothy, for example, he describes these same group of people as those who are held captive by Satan to do his will. He told the Jews, the religious leaders, you're of your father the devil. You always want to do the will of your father. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, and that's what you want to do, is lie and murder. And so he says that's, that's why some don't hear it. That's why some do not respond as the preacher wants them to and as the Christian wants them to who shares the gospel. And then he says in verse 5, and again, remember he's saying this because he's defending his ministry. He says in verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. 
For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so this is the second part. So the first part is that for some, the gospel of the glory of Christ is concealed. It's hidden. It's veiled. There's no glory in it to this person. But for others, the gospel of the glory of God in Christ, it is revealed. It is revealed. And so here's the first point under that. That the gospel to whom the glory of God in Christ has been revealed has this effect. It produces the wonder of worship and it produces a soul humility. A soul humility and a wonder producing worship. Look again at verse 5. He says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves. Some of you have bond servants for the sake of Christ. Now this is the exact opposite then of what the false teachers were doing. Paul's saying we're not preaching ourselves. That's what these people who are coming in who are trying to win your affection are doing. They want you to follow them. They don't want you to follow Christ. The message that they're preaching isn't something that produces the glory of Christ in the heart, it produces the glory of men and the wonder of men. And again, Jesus said that to the false teachers. You seek glory from one another. And you don't seek glory that is from the only God, the only true God. And that's what these false teachers, they receive glory from one another and they receive glory from those they try to win over to their side. But it was not producing the glory of Christ. It was not producing souls captured with the glory of Christ. The message in the ministry of false teachers was not designed to produce wonder at God's grace, humility before the majesty of Christ, but rather to produce followers of them. Let me give you just a few examples, or just a couple statements. He says, since many, and this is uh, 2 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18, after he already described them as being workers of Satan, these false teachers who had another gospel, he says this in verse 18. Here's how he describes it. Since many boast according to the flesh, in other words, in human ability, in human skill, ultimately by human motives. He said, I will boast also. For you being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly. For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you. That's what they were doing. If anyone devours you, they were taking advantage of them and manipulating them and using them again for their own purposes. If anyone takes advantage of you and anyone exalts himself and if anyone hits you in your face. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison. But in whatever respects anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness, I am just as bold myself. And he goes on to describe not his human strength and his human ability, but his human suffering for the gospel. What he gave up in order to bring the gospel to them, not what he sought to gain from them. Not to take advantage of them, not to devour And this is always the pattern in Galatians chapter 6. You don't have to turn there, but he says this. Of false teachers. He says in verse 13 For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. So these were Jews who came in who said they believed in Christ as the Messiah, but you also had to keep certain aspects of the law and you had to kind of follow their teaching and so forth. And he says, These desire, and at the end of verse 13, to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. In other words, look at all of our converts. Look at the people following us. Look at the influence that we have. But Paul says, But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. So this is then the heart of a true preacher, of a true servant of God. It is that Christ would be exalted and not self. And he says, This is the very heartbeat and lifeblood of his ministry. And when Christ has been preached this way, which is where he's going with this, then it has a necessary response of worship. And it has a necessary response of obedience. What was the message then that he preached? It was the message that will be given testimony to in these baptism waters. 
It's the message that was believed and that is being declared and proclaimed. He said, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. Christ Jesus as Lord. This is a worship producing wonder. Christ Jesus as Lord. It is then to preach the entire wonder of the person and the work of Christ. We sing during Christmas uh, a song. See if you can guess where it's from. Uh, the last verse of it, of this one song, on one of the verses says this. G I won't try to sing it. Uh, it would not encourage you. Uh, but he says, uh, Jesus is Lord at thy birth. Do you remember that? Jesus, Lord. I did it. <laughs> Jesus, Lord at thy birth. Okay, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> But we sing this song, Jesus is Lord at that, at that birth, at his birth. As a matter of fact, the whole song goes like this. Uh, I almost want to sing it together here because it's like Christmas. Uh, you can go, you go, silent night, holy night, son of God, love's pure light, radiant be. From thy holy face With the dawn of redeeming grace Jesus, Lord, at thy birth Jesus, Lord, at thy birth Hey, you should be in the choir <laughs> That was great. That was good. You ever think about what's being said there? This is the message that Paul preached. Jesus is Lord at thy birth. That means while his lordship was something to be manifested out of the course of his life and out of the course of his work, the inherent glory of his being was present as the Son of God in flesh while a baby in the manger is what we sing in the song. And so he says, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord. We preach him as Lord. And there is a whole mass of truth that is behind that statement. Let me give you just very, very quickly at least five things, though, that he's declaring. When we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying this. When we sing that song at Christmas, we're singing about this. We are saying, first of all, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the one through whom and for whom all things were made. Grasp that statement. What's said and what Paul is going to say in 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 6, let me read that first. He says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. In Colossians 1, he'll say that all things exist for him. So a big question in apologetics sometimes is why is there something rather than nothing? You've heard me mention that before. What's the biblical answer? There's something rather than nothing because God wanted to create to give it to his son, the father, that he might be head and Lord over all. And everything that was made exists because by the will of the Father, it came into being through the agency of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the universe exists. It exists for Him. It exists through Him. There's not one thing that has come into being that has come into being that did not come into being by His own power and will and glory and authority. We're not proclaiming merely... The divine reality of a baby in the womb and a man who would walk the earth, we're saying that is the one through whom the earth came into being and into existence. Not only that at some point back in time, but that everything exists through him by the very word of his power. And everything exists and is being moved along to the end to come under his lordship and his authority, the world that he reconciled, the world that he judged, and the world that he will receive a kingdom that he will receive out of that world that he'll then offer back up to the Father for the glory of God. So we're saying that. That's what we're saying. We're saying, secondly, that he is the eternal Son of God who robed himself in humanity to reveal God and to bring his salvation. Paul goes on to say in that passage, 
of 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, of 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he says this. I'll just read it. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He's reflecting the words that he said in Philippians chapter 2, even though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself of the full experience and display of his glory to cover it for a time within the confines of humanity that he might live as a man in the form of man and become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why? So that we, in the accomplishment of his work, might partake of his inheritance. And we actually are part of that inheritance. We are that inheritance. And he says that's what we're proclaiming. That he's the son of God who came to redeem what was given to him. A people. Thirdly, we're saying this, that he's the son of God in humanity who gave himself then as a sacrifice for sin at the hands of sinful men. That's what we're declaring. And that's what will be declared in baptism. That's the message. Listen to this statement. And, and listen to this in light of what Paul is saying in, uh, in our text. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says this. He says in verse 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling so that His message would not become with His own personal power and skill and rhetorical ability, but it would come merely in the power of the Holy Spirit so that whatever change was wrought would be clearly the work of God. So he came with a message of Jesus Christ crucified and all that that meant. And then he says this in verse 8. But it's a wisdom that he spoke in Christ Christ crucified that was missed by this age and is the veil. He says, but it's a wisdom in verse 7 which God predestined before the ages to, interestingly, to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So who was crucified? The Lord of glory. The glorious Lord, the majestic one through whom all things came into being. When we proclaim him as Lord, we're saying the one on that cross was not merely a man, not merely a good man, but it was the very Lord of glory of the entire universe who had come to redeem his people, to reconcile all things to himself. We're saying this as well. We're saying that he is the eternal son of God in flesh, crucified, buried, risen, Lord of heaven and earth, and who is right now having all things subjected under his feet as head and ruler. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, let's listen to this. He says, but now... You want a worldview? You want a biblical worldview? Like, how do I frame the events of this world? How do I think about this world? How do I think my own life in, in my own position, in my own place in this world? Well, here's, here's one. He says, but now Christ has been raised, in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15, raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. This is the resurrection at his return to take his people. And then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God, the Father, and Father, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and authority and power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet the last enemy that will be abolished is death in verse 27 for he has put all things in subjection under his feet who? well when he says all things are put in subjection it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him in other words he's not talking about the father being subjected to the son but the father is subjecting all things to the son who stands over them as head and Lord. And then he says in verse 28, And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. That's a biblical worldview. That God created all things for his Son, that out of the fall God redeemed a people for himself to the glory of the Son, to the glory of the Father, that in that redemption he has accomplished his rule and position as 
as king and ruler over a kingdom, that God is even now establishing that kingdom in the world, calling in its citizens by faith in Christ, that when that kingdom is full, his kingdom work is full here, he will return from heaven, and when he returns from heaven, he will reign on earth, and in the last of his enemies... At the end of a thousand year period are destroyed. He will then take this glorious kingdom and he will as the son and the head and the Lord and the mediator offer it back up to the father that the triune glory of father, son and spirit may forever be the gaze and the wonder of his people whom he has redeemed and he has resurrected. That's a biblical worldview. That's where you're headed. That's what God is doing. We're claiming one last thing. That the eternal Son of God, exalted to the right hand then, is also a king who is returning to bring salvation and to establish his kingdom on earth. In verse of chapter 1 Corinthians 11, don't, don't turn to these, I'll just read it. When we take the Lord's Supper, we're declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord as his people. Did you think of that? When you take the Lord's Supper, we are declaring that we are the body of Christ. We are the fruit of His redeeming work. We are a people who are yielded to Him in submitted faith and trust and love. We are a people who are anticipating His return and His establishment of His kingdom. Listen to what Paul says. We say this every week that we do communion. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Until he comes. We're saying that crucified Lord is the resurrected Lord. And that resurrected Lord is the returning Lord. And he will establish his kingdom. Now to understand this message then that Christ is Lord. This true message of the gospel. Is to have an indelibly humbling impact on the soul. It couldn't be otherwise. To come to truly know, not merely intellectually, but to know in the way that Jeremiah was talking about, everyone will know the Lord. It doesn't mean they'll know about the Lord. It means they'll know the Lord from the heart in true faith. And so to come to truly know the Lord and to grasp one so glorious, who is so far above us, so superior to us in majesty and glory, and yet so full of mercy and love to sinners such as us, could have no other effect than to move to worship and, secondly, to soul-humbling service. So look at what Paul says. This is actually quite amazing. Quite amazing. And, and I'm going to get to these points pretty quick. But let's look at what he says. He says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, in all the majesty and the wonder and the fullness of what that means. And he says, And we preach ourselves then as your slaves. As your slaves. That is an amazing statement. For the sake of Christ, we're your slaves. So to grasp the glory of Christ, let's just make this point. As Lord, when it's truly understood, produces in the heart a deep humility. A humility that completely and sincerely grasps the words of John the Baptist. Do you know which ones? He must increase and I must decrease. If you're a Christian, you know what that means. If we're a believer in Christ, we know what that means. We don't live it out perfectly, for sure. But we know what it means and the deepest part of our soul and our hearts knows that that's right and that's what we want. We want him to increase who is the Lord of glory and we want ourselves to decrease. We want ourselves to decrease so much that we don't even think about ourselves. We're self-forgetful. We're not even in the equation because the mind is so set on Christ, so set on his glory. And that doesn't decrease our joy. It actually increases our joy. It's the place of peace and the place of blessing, the place of glory. But here's what Paul, listen to what he says. Here's, here, here is uh, the point. That the level of our humility and love before Christ and service to Christ is a direct reflection of how much we grasp the gospel and who he is. It's a direct reflection. It's a direct reflection. And so Paul's language here of Christ's lordship naturally leads him to use this language of slave, of bondservants or slave. Some of you have servants, but that's not, that's not great. 
He uses the word of slave, and it fits with Lord. There's a master, and there's a slave. He's the master. We're slaves. But here's the interesting thing here. Here's the striking thing. We can understand that part, that he's the Lord. He's the Lord resurrected, and we are the slaves. And so we go expecting to say, as he does in other places, so then that we are rightly responding to him when we understand ourselves as slaves of Christ. But what does he say here? Look at what he says. He says, we're your slaves. You're your slaves, Corinthian church, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Jesus. He says, we're slaves, that's Paul and his companions in ministry, to the Corinthian church. And here it is. Here's the spiritual principle, and here's the reality. Is this. And it's hard to say because I know... Well, let me give it to you. Here's the spiritual principle. To be Christ's slave and under his lordship is to be a slave to his people. That's the spiritual principle. To be Christ's slave and to be under his lordship is to be a slave to his people. Service to Christ is service to his people. That's the connection. Service to Christ is service to people. Love for Christ is manifest in love to his people. So to say, I love Jesus, but I can't stand his people, is you can't have that. It doesn't work that way. To love Christ is to love his people. To serve Christ is to serve his people in whom he dwells. In whom he dwells by his spirit. He says in other places, I won't turn there, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Now, someone may be fine to say they're a slave of Christ because, well, I mean, he's so glorious. There's no competition there, right? I'm not competing with Christ for glory. That's a lot easier to say. It's a lot harder to say, I'm your slave for Christ's sake. That takes a level of humility and spiritual reality that is much more telling and much more difficult. Different story in the test of true humility and grasping this point when this requires us to view our service to Christ as making ourselves to sla- as slaves to others. So we cannot truly love others until we first love God. And we cannot truly love God until if we say that we do not love other Christians. That's the connection. So, and I don't know who this applies to here, to say I'm a Christian and I love God, but I don't go to church. It's not about going to church. Forget about going to church. It is about going to church, but it's not about some kind of activity. It is to say, I go to church. Why? Because God's people are gathered there. That's why. Because God's word is preached there. That's why. Because the people I'm called and commanded to serve are there. I'm not going to go out in the woods and meditate on the blue sky and have my relationship with God and ignore the people in whom he dwells and say that I love Christ. He's saying it doesn't work that way. So if there's nothing in your heart that longs to be with the people of God when they're gathered on a Sunday morning, if you can just as easily for a month straight go do something else, then that's a problem. That's a problem. Because he says here, to love Christ, to to grasp the message of the gospel is to love his people. It's to make ourselves their servants just as he was. And now again, we don't do that perfectly. By a long measure, and if you don't have to know me more than five seconds to know, I don't do that perfectly, or any of us. But that is to say that's the longing as a Christian. It is to say that's what I want to be. And when I fail, I realize I fail at what I want. And you move in that direction, and that's what we should be doing. That's what gives evidence of his life. Uh, We won't turn there, but you know, Jesus demonstrated that. He says, if I, the Lord, and the teacher washed your feet, what should you do? You should wash the feet of each other as well. Well, let me go here because I have to wrap this up. Let's look at this last part. Second part of this is then that God, this ability to see Christ and this transformation that takes place, he says in verse 6, is a sovereign work of God, and particularly God the Spirit. Look at what he says. This is the gospel revealed in its truest sense. Verse 6, For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So to see Christ in that way and to see Christ in that transforming way where genuine worship is produced, a genuine love for Christ and a love for his people, it is because God has done something. God has done something sovereignly as the Lord of heaven and earth. And he makes 
then the comparison of God's sovereign power here in redemption to his sovereign power in creation. And the idea is this, that the one who brought forth creation by the exercise of his will is he who brings forth the reality of spiritual life and redemption in the believer by the exercise of his will. Listen to James say it. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. This is very similar in some ways to Jesus' own explanation of why many weren't believing him in John 6. He says, many weren't believing him. Why? Because all whom the Father gives to me will come to me. And they will be taught of God, he says later. Those are the ones that will come to me. Here he puts it in this way. Because him who sovereignly called light out of darkness in creation is the one who sovereignly calls out spiritual light in a darkened heart in redemption. Paul may even here be thinking of his Damascus Road event where he saw the great light of the exalted Christ revealed to him and it was the, uh, the time, that experience and that whole complex of events of his salvation. He may be referring to that here. He may be referring to that paradigmatically. In other words, of saying not that everybody's going to have Jesus appear to them on a vision on the Damascus Road while you're traveling, hopefully not while you're driving. But he is to say this, that that same sovereign revelation of God wherein the light and the truth of Christ was revealed to the sinner is how everybody comes to know him. Not in the same way, of course, but in that same sovereign exercise of his will. That's how a sinner comes to know him. This is the work of the Spirit. And what happens then when he reveals this light, the light that shines out of darkness? What happens in the sinner? Well, there's a few things that happen. One is this. When God shines the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face or in the heart of a sinner, uh, of one who is still in their natural state that he's calling to faith in Christ, one of the first things that we become aware of is our own sin. Our own need to be in the light. To be brought out of darkness is to be brought from darkness to light. So seeing God's glory in Christ includes seeing your sin in the light of His glory. It includes seeing our condemnation in light of His redemption, His righteousness in light of our unrighteousness, His strength in light of our weakness, His beauty in light of our deformity, His purity in light of our corruption of mind, heart, and affections. And it is to say, this is what I want. That I am so abysmally in need of what is being extended to me in the gospel. That's why he'll later say, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Look, when I see the light of Christ, I'm no longer a proud, exalted vessel. I'm an earthen vessel who's nothing. The treasure is all in Christ. He'll say it in various ways and other, at other times. He'll say, I'm the chief of sinners and God showed mercy to me so that every sinner, no matter how deep and wide and far and consistent your sin has been, you can know that God's mercy can extend to you as well. Why? Because it extended to me. First Timothy 1. It is for Paul to come to realize in this that he who was so proud of his own obedience, who was so proud of his own goodness, who was so proud of his own religious attainments, all of a sudden when he came face to face with Christ, realized that it was dung, it was nothing, it was meaningless, it was less than meaningless. In fact, everything he thought was to his account was actually a great burden that would have accounted for his condemnation. And so to see the light is to see ourselves as we truly are. And to see God as he truly is. And it is to see that God's glory is in the face of Christ. And it's the knowledge of that glory. The knowledge of that glory. Yes, there is an objective knowledge because it is the gospel he preached. The gospel is a body of truth. It is truths declared about a person. It's not ideas. It's reality of Christ who came and was promised and came and lived and died and rose and is returning. But he says it's when that truth is grasped in the heart. It's the light that has shown the knowledge of the glory of God. You'll hear that in every testimony. I hope many of you know that in your own life. But in your baptism, that's what you're going to hear. Is there was a time when there was no glory. I thought I was a Christian. And then there was glory. And then there was Christ. And I would have given everything to follow him. Everything. Nothing was as precious as Christ was. And as Christ is. So how do, what is the evidence of this? And I'm just going to mention these and then we're going to wrap up and 
sing and, and hear our testimonies. He says this. He, he says he's given the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And, and let me just say, that is the gospel. How do you know if you believe the gospel? It isn't whether you can spout off facts, of course. It isn't even what you do. It isn't even a moral life. It isn't even a moral life with memorizing systematic theology. It isn't even a moral life memorizing systematic theology and telling everybody of what you know about it. That's not the evidence of the gospel. Those are all good and can be a part. If you want to know how, do I know Christ? Do I know him? Here's what you ask yourself. Do I see within my heart a glory of God in Christ as redeemer, as creator, as Lord that pulls out of me faith and repentance and obedience and trust? Not perfectly, but I can say at the deepest part of my being, that's what I want to do. And when I fail to do that, I feel my failure because I love him. And my love compels me to serve him. And my lack of love to him humbles me and realizes that I live every moment and second by grace. And that grace then causes thankfulness and a desire to keep pursuing him. That's the idea. That's how you know if you're a Christian, if you love Christ. It's not a list of, I mean, yeah, there are truths that have to be believed, definitely. If anyone strays too far, John warns, uh, they're not in Christ. But it is to say that those truths put, produce in us a love for him. A love for him. Well, we won't have time to get through all these, but I do want to mention this. How do we, how do we give evidence then of this? And how do we grow in this? Well, the first and foremost is this. The first and foremost is this. It means this. If we've tasted of the glory of Christ and we've tasted of his glory, it means we want to see more of it. And where do we see his glory? Peter said this, if you remember when we went through 1 Peter, he says, we love him whom we have not seen. Do you remember that in verse 8? Though how you have not seen him, you love him. You love him. Have you ever seen Christ? I hope you say no. <laughs> you know, anyway, you know what I mean by that. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. He's never. He's not shown up in my bathroom or, you know, at the end of my bed in one night, you know, in glory. Where do you see Christ? You see him in his word. That's where the glory of Christ is revealed. And so what is it? What is it? And Paul has already said that. Look at, go back up to chapter 3. He says their minds were hardened. What? As they read the old covenant, as they read scripture, they never moved on to understand the new covenant promise and how it's fulfilled in Christ. And he says this, but when the person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit, verse 17, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's the freedom, the spiritual freedom, no longer under the confines of the law, but the freedom to serve God in truth and in grace and in joy. He says there's liberty and we all, look at verse 18, with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed from the same, into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. And that Lord the Spirit is most clearly understood as this. What is he? Is this is that the Lord who is now experienced as the Spirit in us. Christ says, if I go, I won't leave you at orphans. I will come to you. When does he come? When the helper comes. He, Paul will say later, it's God in you. It's Christ in you. How? By the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. If anyone does not have him, he is none of his. And how do we behold in the mirror? What is the mirror here? Well, it is that mirror, it is what we look into to see the glory of the Lord that the others were looking into and could not see it. It is Scripture. We see the glory of God in the face of Christ as He is revealed on the pages of Scripture. And so that's the question. Do you love to see that glory in Scripture? You can read Scripture, but do you see the glory of God in it? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It's in Scripture. That's why we who know him love to hear his word. That's why we love to read it. That's why we love to talk about it. Do you love to talk about Scripture? Do you love to read Scripture? Do you see God's glory in it? Well, there's more. I'm actually going to just leave it there. And just make this last statement here. 
is to say this, that if we are seeing this glory and being changed, even as Paul gives evidence here, it means that we'll be willing to follow him with sacrifice. It means that the temptations of this world in terms of those things that would distract us from Christ or that are sin become less and less attractive, that we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, and we are longing more and more for them. Where do we see those? We see them again in Scripture. And as that happens, one said this statement, and I'll end with this. Changed desires come through altered appetites. What is needed in everything in this generation is an acquired taste for God and all His majesty and for what it will mean to live and be with Christ forever. And so, that's what it means to believe the gospel. And as you hear these testimonies, that's what you'll hear. And so the question is, and so often what we hear in testimonies is this. I thought I was a Christian. I thought I was a Christian. And then one day I realized, I don't love Christ. I don't really hate my sin as I thought I should. And then, I, but I wanted to. And so then there was this change that came back. And now I want to read his word. Now I want to pray. Now I want to serve. That's what Paul's talking about. And so those of us who have experienced that grace of God, we rejoice like the angels when we hear that. Some of you are going to hear these words and be a total stranger. They're going to be strange to you. Why? Because a veil lies over your face and your heart. You're going to hear it and you're going to leave and your life is going to be totally like it was before. And so I hope for those who are in that case that you hear and you follow the instructions, whenever one turns to the Lord, that veil is removed. That if you don't experience that in your life, that's not the truth, that you would turn to the Lord, that you would ask Him to say, I beg you to give that to me because I can't do it on my own. On my own, I'm darkness, but in Christ, I can have light. Show me this light. And that you would have your own testimony one day, either here or somewhere else. Let me pray. And then as I pray, they're going to come sing a song and then we're going to hear our testimonies. Father, thank you for your word. Give us the sight of Christ. Oh, I need it. We need it. How easy it is to read your word and to miss the glory. Show us your glory in Christ. Be so gracious and merciful to us that Christ becomes more attractive and pleasing to us than our sin. That Christ becomes more glorious to us than this world. How easy it is to be dull the things of the glory of God. And yet, I ask you that you would not let that happen and don't let us stay in that state if some of us are that you would awaken in us a freshly again the sight of the wonder and the mystery and the majesty of Christ and for some who have never come out of darkness into light I pray that today you would show them that grace and that mercy and that they'd know you in truth bless our time as we hear these testimonies we commit it to you in the name of Jesus Amen